Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I hate to break up what I am sure are terrific conversations, but this is the beginning of a day of what we hope to be terrific conversations. Uh, I will keep this very brief. As you've seen, we have a very tightly packed schedule, and so we're going to try to keep to our marching orders. Uh, my name is Frank Gavin, and I'm the director of the Robert S. Strauss Center for International Security and Law at the University of Texas. And I am thrilled to welcome you to the inaugural Next Generation Project Texas Assembly, centered upon the theme of energy, environment, and U.S. global policy. We are really looking forward to a day of intense, exciting, but respectful debate and discussion on these critically important issues, and to see, to gain knowledge and lessons from the best young minds of Texas, and to see what these minds can provide, not just to Texas, but to the nation and the world. Just meeting some of you last night, uh, Celeste and I were talking about this, and you look at these biographies and you're just extraordinarily impressed, and then meeting you in person to see that you're even more impressive than you are on paper is uh, uh, quite an accomplishment. As you no doubt are aware, you're a unique group, selected for your talent, your leadership, and your ideas. But you're also here because we believe that by creating powerful networks of emerging leaders from different perspectives, vocations, and outlooks, people who might not otherwise have met, we have the opportunity to create a special, powerful, and lasting bond between emerging leaders moving forward. Let me tell you a story that illustrates the power of this bond and the potential influence that we hope to seek. We had our first meeting of the American Assembly's Next Generation Project exactly five years ago today in Dallas. It was a remarkable event. Last week, I saw one of the graduates of that assembly who was also a member of the leadership team, Colin Call. At the time, in 2006, Colin was a smart young professor that no one had ever heard of. Today, he's the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, responsible for U.S. military policy in the Middle East, including Iraq, a pretty important job. His colleague, Sharon Burke, will join us today at lunch. She is an Assistant Secretary of Defense in charge of the awesome task of making the U.S. military green and clean. In 2006, when she first, uh, we first met her in Dallas, she was a young but relatively unknown analyst at a small think tank. I saw Colin last Friday, and he was thrilled to hear that the project was continuing where it had began, in Texas. He talked about how no one could have known how influential the ideas that emerged from eight national assemblies held over four years could be. More importantly, he said, were the networks of smart future leaders from every sector that were created by the project. He listed a long range of policy issues uh, in both the Bush and Obama administration where both where next gen fellows, their ideas and their connections had made a difference. Innovation policy, social policy, science policy, intelligence reform, banking and financial reform and military policy in the wars on terror and in Iraq and Afghanistan, just to mention a few. Now, some of these ideas may have emerged anyway, and some of the smart people, no doubt, would have been selected for positions of national leadership, even without NextGen. But the project, according to Colin, had, been an ex had an extraordinary multiplier effect that he saw everywhere he went in Washington, bringing people together who would never have known each other and encouraging all sorts of innovative and creative ideas, and connections, and uh, relationships that may never have happened in the absence of NextGen. Imagine if we could do this for the state of Texas. That is our goal. That is what we're trying to do today. So that five years from now, when there is an important emerging issue or set of issues that arises in Texas, you all know each other. And you all were part of this first inaugural uh, Next Gen Texas project. Now, who is responsible for this wonderful project and its influence? As I mentioned last night, none of this would have happened without the leadership of David Mortimer, the president of the American Assembly, at Columbia University. Bob Inman, a trustee of the assembly and an early and enthusiastic supporter, was also crucial, and we're very grateful that he will be joining us this evening. And of course, we now have John and Becky Brumley, whose generosity and vision have made this new and exciting version of the initiative possible. Thank you so much, John. But there's one person more than any other who could be called the father of this effort, and he should be thanked for his extraordinary influence on the Next Generation Project has had in his five short e years, 
and the influence we hope the Next Generation Texas Project will have in the years to come. And that is our distinguished speaker, Richard Fisher. Now, most of you know Richard as a strong and effective leader of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. Before taking this position, after a distinguished and successful career in both the private and public sector, he served as the chairman of the American Assembly. In that position, he had a vision to reach out and go beyond the typical halls of power, what he called the quote unquote Amtrak corridor, to go into the country to avoid the usual suspects, people like professors and policymakers, and bring smart, innovative young people from every field and every part of the country to debate and discuss and innovate to meet the most pressing policy challenges the country faced. Richard recognized well before anyone else that our legacy institutions, which had served us so well during the Cold War, were in many cases old and tired and not up to the challenges of the 21st century. He understood we needed new voices, new perspectives, new energy. A remarkable vision. I must confess, when he first told me about it, well over six years ago, I told him it may have been the worst idea I have ever heard. That he was crazy shows you how much I know and how wrong I was. For my ignorance, Richard told me he wanted me to help put the vision into place, which has been one of the most exciting, rewarding professional experiences of my life. And it is a great thrill to continue this project from its new home at the Strauss Center and to bring to the national project, uh, to bring to Texas what we hoped we achieved on the national project. So we're all here today because of Richard Fisher. And if, as we hope, great new ideas are created and new friendships established, it will be because of his original vision, leadership, and ideas. It is a great honor and a true pleasure to introduce my good friend and mentor, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank and the father of the Next Generation Project, Richard Fisher. Well, Professor Gavin is as hyperbolic as he is tall. <laughs> and um, I also want to thank the Bromleys for their great support here. And I want to give you a little sense of history. Uh, first, I want to apologize to David Mortimer because uh, a couple years ago, they gave me the Eisenhower Medal, and uh, it's one of the great things that the Assembly's done for a very long time. I was the first non-entity that ever got that award for public service, and they gave me a little rosette, which I didn't wear today. But I'll tell you why. It's on my pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> and I forgot to take it off. Actually, I like to tease it. If I get old enough, John, to wear pajamas, I'm going to put the rosette on my pajamas. A um, little bit of history here. And I hope you all realize that you are following in distinguished footsteps because, and this goes back to David's heritage as well, the idea and the American Assembly, as we like to project it and have under David's leadership and through the Strauss Center here, really originated with one of the most incredible presidents, at least in my lifetime, and probably the greatest president of my lifetime, which is Dwight D. Eisenhower. Uh, and working together when he was president of Columbia University with a remarkable group of people, including David's grandfather, including Averill Harriman. Now, this is how smart Eisenhower was. He got Democrats to finance his launch up to becoming Republican president of the United States. <laughs> but working with a project director named Bill Bundy, who for your generation may not mean anything, but for Mr. Bromley's and mine and David's and the older folks in town, became a very famous figure in the United States. And they pulled together something called Goals for America. Well, that's what Eisenhower did as president. It was all designed under the aegis of the American Assembly and pulling together then a very small group of the brightest minds in the country, regardless of party, regardless of partisanship. And I think it's fair to say that that transformed America. So. Um, I think it illustrated the point that we try and have tried to do with this next-gen project. Now, America has changed since back those old days. Everything was concentrated in the East Coast. In fact, I think everything was concentrated in your grandfather's back pocket, as I recall. Uh, Mr. Harriman and the Harriman family, E.H. Harriman, the sons of E.H. Harriman, really were a dynamic 
Titanic family in America, and you had an awful lot of concentration in the eastern seaboard, the Amtrak corridor. Our idea was to notice, obviously, there had been shifts that had taken place. And I don't have to recite what a certain presidential candidate from Texas has been reciting ad nauseum, but in terms of leadership, job creation, um, different sizes and different approaches to government, it's coming out of this part of the country. And the shift that took place to the south and to the west was basically, to me, not being noticed uh, by those that were still in power. And you cannot lead unless you reflect your base. And the base is now much more widely distributed. If you think about just one statistic, which we at the Dallas Fed calculate, by the way, this isn't a political calculation, 40% of all the jobs created in America since the National Bureau of Economic Research, which is Cambridge, Massachusetts based, run until recently by Marty Feldstein, declared that the recession was over, 40% of those jobs have been created right here in Texas. That's an amazing thing when you think about it. So it's important to engage young, bright people like you. I don't care what your party is. I don't care what your philosophical biases are. Get to know each other. Pull yourselves together. Realize that this is no longer a white Episcopalian male-dominated society, which is what it was back when President Eisenhower put together that group. But we're a diverse society. We've achieved greater gender equality. We've achieved much greater racial equality. And we are a diverse nation, and that's our wealth. We need to draw from everywhere and everybody to move us forward. I want to talk for just a second about the challenges, and I want to make some recommendations. If you read no other book about economics, I don't care whether you're interested in economics or not, read the recent biography of a man named Joseph Schumpeter. Schumpeter was an unusual guy. He was a Czech who escaped Nazis, came to my alma mater, which is Harvard University, and taught economics. And by the way, he started out his first class, Frank, you'll love this. He told his first class that he had three aims in life. He wanted to be the greatest economist in history, the greatest lover in history, and the greatest horseman in history. And then he followed up saying, I've not done well with the horses. <laughs> um, he's quite an egomaniac. But he came up with the concept of creative destruction, which relates to this project. What he meant by creative destruction is as you go through time, certain things that are cherished and certain ways of doing things get destroyed. We were an agricultural nation, we are no longer. Yet we're the biggest agricultural producer in the world. Ag is 1% of the domestic output of the United States. It's 1% of the domestic output of Texas. Uh, and we've moved up the value-added ladder. Well, if you were a protectionist or if you were stuck in the old way of doing things, we would have stayed an agricultural nation and people would have passed us by. We evolved. We evolved through creative destruction. And understanding that process, I think, is very important. The destructive side is very, very painful. We're going through that right now. I'll come to that in just a minute. And you have impulses that want to keep things the way, whether it's the Luddites of the old days or the protectionists of the current days. The beauty of America is that we've always beaten the system and we've created better things than we destroyed. Texas is where we are masters of creative destruction. Part of that's because we have limited government. Part of it's because we have a different attitude. Part of it's because until the end of the Civil War, by the way, Austin had 900 people. And we were really fighting the Comanches on that border while we were fighting the Civil War. Of course, Texas was part of the Confederacy. And Maximilian in Mexico simultaneously. People forget that. During the recession, if you look at the Brookings study that was recently done, again, I don't think Brookings is necessarily conservatively biased. I used to be on their board, I know. Um, they concluded that San Antonio and Austin were the most recession-proof areas of America and ranked fifth or sixth in the world, above Sao Paulo, above Toronto, Canada. Little old Austin, that until 1865, had 900 people there and were still fighting the Comanche Wars. Now is one of the great cities in the world in terms of leadership on economic management. So we now have what Schumpeter called, well, he used a, an analogy, and I'd like you to think about it. He said, if you imagine a railroad, David, you'll like this, a railroad cut across virgin territory, think of the Transcontinental Railroad, 
everything that was optimal before it was constructed is no longer optimal. The genesis of this project was realizing, together with David and working with Frank and working especially with Admiral Inman, who's a remarkable human being, and also some senators, Dick Luger and Sam Nunn and some others, that we had a huge Schumpeterian railroad coursing across the global economy and across our future. And that was globalization, the end of the Cold War, the coming down of the bamboo curtain, and cyberization. When I was your age, or the age of many of you in this room, we were killing the Vietnamese, and they were killing us. My best friend when I was a high school quarterback was my aunt, a fellow named Greg Laffrey. On my 19th birthday, a Vietnamese sniper put a bullet through his head walking across a rice paddy. My wife, as we speak, is in Vietnam. She, if she would, I don't think she'd make it across a rice paddy, but she could do it unafraid. And she's out there in Hanoi and Saigon. In the blink of history's eye, we went from mutually assured destruction to mutually assured competition. There is no Soviet Union. Mao is dead. Pol Pot, thank God, is gone. Ho Chi Minh's embalmed but the system has changed. We now buy Vietnamese bonds and they trade in our marketplace. Uh, and we buy and sell each other's goods. This is what we, Mr. Bromley's and my generation paid a lot of blood and a lot of treasure for an entire generation, and we won. That's the good news. The bad news is now we're going through the destructive phrase of creative destruction and we have to master the creative side. That's what you all are all about. And. This applies not just to the economy, where we're struggling. It applies to everything that we do and every way that we think. I still think, despite the progress that's been made, in part thanks to this project, we still need to reconfigure our military. We still need to figure out what our foreign policy structure should be. To me, it's unthinkable that the United States Senate would vote on a currency bill that is absolute protectionism with the Chinese. We know that that was a tripwire to the last Great Depression. And here we are just hanging on, and our supposed honorable leaders in the Congress and the Senate would take on something that dangerous at this time. That's because they're trapped in the old way of thinking, Frank. And you all are charged with thinking the new way. And old people like me and Mr. Bromley, uh, David's almost as old as we are, um, are incapable of doing it. What we need to do is pull together here in Texas and elsewhere in the country those that can think anew and look at the world through fresh eyes, who understand cyberspace instinctively, who grew up with it, whereas we've had to adjust to it, and who understand instinctively that, unlike my generation, you're not going to be bailed out by government economically. You'll never get a penny of Social Security. You'll never receive a penny of Medicare. The systems are broke. How are we going to replace them? And how are we going to replace all these systems without bringing down the economy or bringing social disorder? These are the challenges that you face. And I couldn't think of a more exciting challenge to face. And you're so lucky. If you look around the room, the complexions, the differences, the gender mix, this was unthinkable in the days when President Eisenhower and Averill Harriman and others put together the original goals for America. So here's the challenge. You put together goals for Texas and you put together through that goals for America and change the way we operate. So you should be Schumpeterian railroads. I want you to course across the, the landscape and just shake it up. And a little destruction will take place, but of course you're charged with creating something still better. And that is the challenge that we put on your backs. So have a nice day. <laughs> That's it. Now, I don't know if you want me to answer any questions or not. Should we, should we take questions from the group if they have them? Sure. If you have them, are you awake? <laughs> any questions at all about anything? We're all reflecting on the They're too shy. <laughs> well, I will tell you that the economy, and I'll talk a little bit about what I do for a living, is in tenuous shape. I'm a central banker. I want you to understand there is a difference, and I hope you understand this, because going forward, it's very important. We provide the fuel. We provide this stuff right here. 
but it has to be used. And right now it's not being used. We've cut interest rates to zero. We've abundantly, in my view, and I'm a dissenter, we've oversupplied liquidity to the economy. But there's enough liquidity for any business to operate, small, large, public, private. We know this from our surveys. We know that we have made, as we call it, we've provided so much accommodation that everything is possible. The trouble is we can fill the gas tank, but people have to be incented to step on the accelerator, engage the transmission, and move the job of creation car forward. It's not happening. And here's an example of where you all need to think about change, and I don't care if you're a D or an R. Uh, the only people that can provide that incentive are fiscal authorities. We elect people to Congress. For generations, Republicans and Democrats have been building a lobby and locking themselves into the old way of doing things, and they're having trouble changing. So the Fed provides liquidity. We fill the gas tank. The fiscal authorities, Republicans, Democrats, what have they done? They've dug a hole for your future, and they're going to bury you in it. They've not failed to fund Medicare. We, educate, we estimated the Dallas Fed that Medicare today, if it were paid off, present value, the obligations already made to the American people that have to be delivered unless you change it, that hole is $100 trillion deep. Now, Pete Peterson has it at $35 trillion. And the difference is we're Federal Reserve people, so we go out to infinity. He only goes out 75 years. Same discount factor. We only produce $14 trillion in output in this country. It's a big hole. Social Security is unfunded. We fight our wars off balance sheet. Somehow we're going to have to correct for all these unfunded liabilities and all these massive deficits and do it in a way that doesn't bring about cardiac arrest in the economy and drive us back into recession. The only way to do it, unless you're from the planet Mars, is through the private sector. If there's anybody here who thinks federal government has the wherewithal or state government, you haven't been listening. The private sector is where the jobs will be created. The federal government's broke. It cannot conceivably finance expansion. So. Here's the challenge. How do you get the incentives put in place to get people to step on the accelerator, engage the transmission, and create jobs? Uh, I'm supposed to be a hawk in the aviary of central bankers. That means I'm very inflation conscious. But that's not the problem right now. The problem is massive unemployment. And I don't care if you're from the Tea Party or the Occupy Wall Street, or there's even an Occupy Fort Worth. Um, it's not very big here, but uh, <laughs> there's a reason for those people, in their, and that is they're in anguish. If people are unemployed, they take to the streets. You have massive unemployment like Greece, you have social disorder. We're on the verge of social disorder. You have to figure out the solutions. We're tired. We're old. And someone's got to figure out a way to incent the people that create jobs in a globalized world where it is absolutely right and proper that if you have money, you can invest it anywhere. Because we won. We won the Cold War. The bamboo curtain came down. We don't kill the Vietnamese anymore, we invest there. We invest in Poland, we invest in the former Soviet Union, we invest in Mexico. If you're a corporate leader, you're paid to do that. Your shareholders demand it. That's the way capitalism works. So not only do you have to fix the holes, repair the deficit, proclivities of Republicans and Democrats who are elected leaders. But we also have to do it in a globalized context, and that is a point that nobody gets. And I never hear from any senator or any congressman. The worst alternative is to protect. And if we protect, we sustain the old. We do prevent destruction, but we do stifle creation. So those are just some thoughts for you, and there's a hand up in the back from that young lady, so I'm going to take her question. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, speaking of the globalization, with the recent signing of the new trade, trade agreement, can you talk about the long and short-term economic impact of Korea and Delta Mountain Cruises with your question? Yeah, I do. I, now, I'm a free trader. I know. I'm an unabashed free trader. <laughs> Just so you know the history there, I started working on that deal with Han duk Su, who then became prime minister, is now ambassador to Washington, under President Clinton. We did the U.S. auto... I think we sold five more cars after that deal. 
Well, you, you know. And I remember doing that press conference with President Clinton, the first time I ever appeared before the White House press corps. I was scared to death, but he just made things so easy. It was great. Um, that's the biggest trade deal we've done in an awful long time. It's symbolically important, and I'm glad the President pushed it forward, and I'm glad the Senate finally did their business. The, the Columbia deal is different. The Panamanian deal is different. There's always this business of fair trade and trade adjustment assistance. I was in USTR. I served in a Democratic administration. Trade adjustment assistance is an awful waste of money. And I say that having served a Democratic president. Uh, it's inefficient. It's a political tool, but you have to use it. And I do think the Korea deal is symbolically important. First, the Europeans had already done a deal, so we don't want to be behind them. Uh, and then secondly, it is not only a major trading partner and the gateway to so much, we have boots on the ground. It's a hot spot. And we have men mostly at the DMZ. It is a hot war zone. We have a crazy man in North Korea. And you know we, the Korean people are on the line, and our people are on the line. I've been to the DMZ. If you ever get a chance, go. And you'll understand in your gut how important Korea is to us. And to deny them a free trade agreement, I think, would have been disgraceful. So I think it is a job creator. I think NAFTA was a job creator, a win-win-win deal. There are three countries in NAFTA. This is a win-win deal. Now, I will say this, too, because you you all are young and all have different experiences, but I remember President Clinton telling me, it's easy negotiating with the Chinese and the Vietnamese. Negotiating with Congress is a lot harder. I haven't forgotten that. So it's you know it takes time to get these things through. Yes? I don't get asked questions about that. That's the first time I've been asked about the dollar in a long time. You know, when it was getting up to 185 on the euro, and people thought we we're going to go to two to one, every audience I spoke to asked about the dollar. Now that it's back to the 140 level, I don't get questions. So I'm kind of interested in the question. Um, maybe the nicest way to put this is that we are now the best looking horse in the glue factory. <laughs> I don't want to be that way. It's up to you to make us the most beautiful filly or the most outstanding stallion in absolute terms. It's, it's, you can't hold your head high when you are less ugly than the other person. And we're less ugly than Europe right now. I want to come back to Europe because I think, I think it is very, very important to realize what's going on there. And here's a good example that I hope will inspire you but also make you realize how difficult the challenges are. The whole Euro, the 17 member federation of Euro, the Eurozone, stems from a vision that two people had, Chancellor Kohl of Germany and François Mitterrand of France. The purpose of that exercise was to make sure that what happened in the fields of Flanders and what happened in 1939 never happened again. So we know that when there's stress between countries, they go to war, particularly it's a European history. Those two visionaries felt that they must unify Europe to make sure that the worst impulses never came forward again. And you know how many people were just killed on the Maginot Line alone. For 100 yards of space, over a million men were killed for 100 yards of space. That can never happen again. Now, that's the vision. Putting it together is very hard, and they expanded very broadly, very quickly, and there are 17 nations involved, and they're disparate, and they have different fiscal policy. But I think they'll keep working at trying to get a solution. You all have a responsibility, which is to read history. And the more difficult thing is, as time passes, young Germans and the Chancellor Merkel and uh, the current President of France have to face the successor generation, like you. And they've forgotten the personal pain of being destroyed. And somehow you have to keep that flame alive. And I think that's what this whole exercise is all about. But they're behind us in terms of bank recapitalization, financial reform. Um, their markets are different than ours. They're not as securitized as ours. That's good and bad. And they have a more limited participation. So in, uh, the contagion can spread very, very quickly. And it can also cross the pond. 
And that's something that we are watching carefully, but we have little power to influence. We have swap lines with them. By the way, we make money off the swap lines. Uh, but they've got to reach their own solution within the context of that dream of those two great leaders. And it's going to be a pretty sticky wicket, pretty difficult to do. So it's important to have a dream, but it's very difficult sometimes to implement that dream, and we're going to see how they get their way through it. I think the dollar will fare relatively well. And last comment on the currency, you do hear comments from the Chinese and others about the SDR. The SDR is the Esperanto of currencies. It's not going to happen. We're speaking English, not Esperanto here. And that's going to continue for a long time. But please do your best as young leaders to just make us a beautiful horse, not just the least ugly horse. That's important. And that's where we are now. Yes, sir. Uh, well, I think your first question was a statement, and your second is a question. So let me, let me, they're, and they're tied together. Um, that's the theory. If you make the return on capital cheap, people will take greater risk on safe capital. So here are the numbers. The 12 Federal Reserve Banks are where banks put their excess reserves. They earn 25 one hundredths of 1% per annum. And right now, they have parked on the balance sheets of the Dallas Fed and the other 11 Fed banks $1.5 trillion. They're not making a great return, 25 one hundredths of 1% 1 per annum. They'd much rather make four, five, six lending. And then corporate America, if you look at the S&P 500, has $2 trillion in excess working capital. And then we know, uh, despite some losses announced in the papers this morning of certain groups, um, that the non-depository financial intermediaries have an enormous amount of cash. These are the buyout guys. So my point is, to deal with the first half of your question, I don't think we need to do any more. I'm in a minority. That's why I dissent. I frankly think the only thing that Operation Twist did was make money on one trade for the Sharpies. And that's already been locked in and closed out. It hadn't done a thing for the American people or for American businesses. And QE2 hasn't done a thing for American businesses. It doesn't do anything until it gets re-engaged in the economy. So we've been building money stock and supply, but it's not going to work. The theory is that if you provide an unattractive return, it will go to work. But you have to adjust the expected return for uncertainty. And right now, we are at conditions of maximum uncertainty in the private sector. We don't, if you're a private sector, you have no idea what your taxes are going to be. None. You don't know how spending patterns are going to shift. Even those that subsidize your customers or what the patterns are or your own subsidies, there are too many subsidies, by the way, generation after generation, lobby after lobby, or how the spending patterns will affect the economy. And then for all the talk of regulation control, I think the Federal Register expanded by 15,000 pages year to date alone. I mean. Nobody knows what's going to govern their behavior. So as long as that's the case, I would argue you're going to accept a minimal return. Business is conducted under conditions of uncertainty. I'm an MBA. I'm not a PhD in economics. I'm proud of that, by the way. Uh, but I was taught that you'll always have conditions of uncertainty. That's why you take decision science and all this stuff, probability theory. You'll never have perfect clarity. But you have to have some clarity. And as far as I'm concerned, by the way, I don't care who's in the White House, Democrat or Republican, I don't care who controls the Congress. They're going to have to provide some clarity. And once you have that clarity, even if business doesn't like it, they can work around it. 
But right now they have no idea. We had this comic opera, which was the debt ceiling negotiations, an, an absolute disgrace. Uh, what, what a business person, a woman or a man takes out of that is, huh? I don't know what's coming. What are my taxes going to be? How are they going to change the spending that affects my consumer base or what I do for a living or the goods or service I produce? And even though I hear good things about they're cutting back on regulation, every day I get hit with something new. So what do you do? You go into what my the president I served last calls a defensive crouch, and you stay there. And it's better than losing money to earn a short return. That's the predicament we are, in my opinion, right now. Now, some of my colleagues differ. They think if you keep blowing up the balloon, eventually it will leak out in the economy. There is a risk there. And the risk is that people begin to say, whoa, the central bank's going to basically monetize the government. My risk is, my perception of that risk is I don't think so because I know the culture that I live within. I know my colleagues, Hawk and Dove, none of us want that. And once we see it, we'll rein in. The real risk is a moral hazard, as economists would call it. If you're a congressperson and you say, hmm, the Fed will do my job, why would you act? I don't care how many people take to the streets. Now, if we say, sorry, pal, we've done it. We're finished. You don't have a choice. You have to act. And, and I do believe we've just given Congress too much leeway by our accommodative measures. So uh, I, I sort of agree with the statement disguised as a question that you asked first. Any others? One more. Yes, ma'am. Do you think China can continue to grow and expand the way they have for the past? I'm going to break every can law. The, uh, the question is, do you think China can continue to grow? Uh, forgive me. If I were hiring you, you could sue me, but I'm not hiring you. How old are you? Okay. Well, you're a little bit older than I was when I went with, uh, on behalf of President Clinton, I was 28. And I was the, the boy in a group led by the Secretary of the Treasury, Michael Blumenthal, to spend nine days with Deng Xiaoping in secret and negotiate the settlement of claims. And let me just, I say that because there's a reason for that history. Uh, President Nixon, or as we used to say at Kissinger McClarty, Secretary Kissinger, normalized political relationships. But we had seized their assets in the United States, not very much money, mostly deposited the Chase Bank, because they had taken, when the communists took over from Chiang Kai-shek, they had taken our railroad stock that we had lent to the nationalist government. And um, so we couldn't send ships into each other's ports without seizing them until we settled those counterclaims. And it fell upon President Carter to do that. So in secret, he sent a group, and I happened to be part of that group. And so I actually have a picture of myself standing behind Deng Xiaoping. By the way, it's invaluable in China today. I can go into any meeting anywhere, and uh, they'll see me, because he really was the man that changed China. He had blood on his hands, but he's the one that brought about the Reformation, post mao Reformation. And I remember sitting in the room, and he, he said, first time that we had heard the expression, it doesn't matter if the cat, he didn't say it's black or white, he said it's yellow or white, or yellow or black, as long as it catches mice. Uh, and then he said, when asked, how rapidly do you think you can grow? Without skipping a beat, he said 8% compounded. Now, I don't know how they did that. They didn't have computers back then. They used the abacus, and it's a function of seven, but that's what he said. So, uh, and I remember we came back and said, you know, he's remarkable, but we don't think it'll work. Well, it worked. They've done better than that. There is a question of how long that can be sustained. Remember, they came off a base of zero. I remember when we landed there, we were the only cars. They were camels and skinny horses and oxen and donkeys from the Beijing import all the way to the Great Hall of the People. And we went to Shanghai for three days because they had no computers, and their typewriters were so out of date that all the documents had to be drafted by hand, of course, using Chinese characters. And the English had to be done at our embassy using typewriters. And Shanghai back then uh, had nothing. I remember we went to a beauty parlor because Mike Blumenthal and I needed to get a haircut. 
and they had the curlers hanging by individual wires, like in the 1800s or whatever. And you go to Shanghai today, it's more modern than any American city. So um, enormous progress has been made, coming off a very low base, still have a per capita income of about $7,000 per annum. You talk about an uneven distribution of wealth in our country, it's enormously unevenly distributed in China. It's a corrupt society, the princelings are horribly corrupt, and it represses expression of speech. We believe here in this country that that's not a formula for long-term success. Under Deng Xiaoping, an enormous liberation took place, but it's a partial liberation. And we'll just have to see how that can continue. But nothing can compound indefinitely to the sky. And the real question is, how do you deal with the social instability that might arise when you create a middle class and they build expectations? Um, and I'll just conclude by saying that I just got elected as an overseer of Harvard University. It's the, the board of directors, like the regents. Um, here's an interesting little fact. Harvard is the number one name brand in China, above McDonald's, above Coca-Cola, above any Chinese company. They value education enormously. They would love for Harvard to affiliate with the university there. We have refused to do so. Why? Because they suppress freedom of speech. Every other college, every other university, including Yale, our mortal enemy, has gone in there <laughs> full bore. And we won't do it because we see, I see at least, personally speaking, significant risk there. So, you know, there's enormous potential. And the last thing I would say is we want them to succeed. It beats having an enemy. It beats being at risk to go to war. And bearing that in mind, we also have to watch their military still the richer that they get. So I think China's a great example of Schumpeter's Railroad. They've changed the course of our history, and we're going to have to adapt and move up the value-added ladder. And I'll conclude with one thing. The other thing you ought to do is go back and read speeches of Winston Churchill. Uh, and I would, as a young person, be inspired. Because he used to talk about what he called the superfine processes. He, like me, going back to the first question, was a free trader. And he said, let them dump any product in our market. We'll take it, refine it, what we would call add value added, move up to the superfine process, and we'll capture the profit margin. It's what we do today, and it's what we need to continue to do. And we'll only do that as long as we have a risk-taking, well-educated society, and that's your op responsibility and your obligation. So again, have a nice day. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Richard, for those inspiring comments. If nothing else, I think we now have a motto. We're going to be, our goal is to be a better horse than the ugliest filly <laughs> in the glue factory. So thank you so much for kicking us off to that start. We'll now have Celeste Gaventner come up, uh, the Associate Director of the Robert S. Strauss Center, and we will begin the opening panel.